Hey everyone and welcome back to this series of videos exploring the psychology of social influence. Social influence is all about how our behaviour can be shaped and changed by others around us and in this video we're taking our second look at conformity, more specifically conformity to social roles and the famous and controversial Stanford Prison Experiment. Let's dive in. In the previous video we looked at conformity and defined it as a change in behaviour or beliefs that comes as a result of real or imagined group pressure. And in this video we're going to more specifically consider conformity to social roles. Social roles can be defined as a pattern of behaviour that is expected of someone when they are in a particular social position. Think about all of the different social roles you and I play on a daily basis. You may be a student and when you're in that social role you speak to your teacher by saying yes sir but when you're with your friends you don't say yes sir you guys take the mic and wind each other up and have a bit of banter which you're careful not to do with your teacher in case you get in trouble or think about being a brister in a coffee shop or a cashier in tesco's where the conversation tends to be a bit more distant and formal and professional and the conversation goes something like how's the weather have you had a nice day do you have a club card those types of social roles are different social roles than being a student and being a friend and each of them has a different set of expectations for the role that you are in Now let's explore the Stanford Prison Experiment. You may be aware to some degree of some of the issues that arise in prisons, and this applies in lots of countries around the world like the UK, but perhaps most notably in the US of A, where this study took place. You know there are serious problems when the President of the USA back in 2015 stood up and said this. We represent 5% of the world's population, 25% of its inmates. That's not an indicator that we want to be the leader in. Then there are more recent documentary films like 13th and Breaking the Cycle, which have highlighted the very troubling behavior that goes on. But the culture basically is an oppressive culture. You know, we're uh, the scum of the earth and, and deserve to be punished beyond what the judge and the magistrates decide what our punishment should be. What's very sad, however, bringing us back to the focus of this video, is that these same sets of questions about prison behaviour that we are asking now, they were asking back in the 1970s when this study was done. Now it's important to understand that at the time all these prison problems were going on, that there was a dominant view to try and explain it, and this was known as the dispositional hypothesis. This states that the major contributing factor for the violence, brutality and dehumanisation that could be seen in prisons could be traced to the characteristics of those in charge, the guards, and the characteristics of those imprisoned, the prisoners. In other words, some people would say that the reason for the problems in prisons was that the guards were sadistic, uneducated and insensitive people. They were the problem. And then they would say that the prisoners, by definition, are people who have a disregard for law and order and have an increased tendency to be impulsive and aggressive. They're the problem. In other words, the problem in prisons is to do with the characteristics of the people in the prisons and not necessarily to do with the situation of the prison. To explore this, the psychologist Philip Zimbardo conducted the experiment at Stanford University in California. Zimbardo was tasked with finding out whether the prisoners or guards had bad personalities and were evil people, or whether there were environmental factors at play, including conformity to social roles. Participants were recruited for this study via a newspaper advert asking for male volunteers to take part in a psychological study of prison life and that they would be paid $15 a day for taking part. From those who replied to the advert, 24 students were selected. They were selected because they were the most stable, mentally and physically, and they were the least involved in antisocial behaviour. These male students were all middle class and they were all strangers to one another before the study took place. Finally, these 24 students were randomly assigned to one of two roles, the role of a prisoner or the role of a guard. Now let's talk about the prisoners, and here's where things start to get very interesting. With the cooperation of the local police department, all of the participants assigned to the prisoner role were arrested outside of their home. A 
police officer charged them with burglary or armed robbery, were handcuffed, read their legal rights, and with neighbours watching, put into the rear of the police car. Upon arrival at the prison, the prisoners were stripped, deloused with a spray, and made to stand naked in the prison yard. In order to promote anonymity amongst the participants, the prisoners were made to wear a uniform with an identification number on the front and the back, and they had a light chain and lock around their ankle. From now on, they will be referred to as their number and not by their name. All participants signed a contract before they took part in the study, but for the prisoners, they were made particularly aware of the fact that they would have little or no privacy during the duration of the study, and that some of their civil rights will be suspended, excluding physical abuse. For example, if the prisoners wanted to go to the toilet, they first of all needed to get public permission from the guards. And if that was granted, they were then handcuffed and blindfolded as they were taken to the toilet. The participants assigned to the guards attended a meeting the day before the prisoners were brought to the prison. In that meeting, they were introduced to the superintendent of the prison, Philip Zimbardo himself. Their task was to maintain a reasonable degree of order within the prison. The specifics of how this might be done was never detailed. However, it was made very clear to them that they were not allowed any form of physical punishment or physical aggression towards the prisoners. The guards too were given uniforms, but also clubs, whistles and reflective sunglasses. The outfitting of both the guards and the prisoners in uniforms was designed to promote group identity and to remove any sense of individual identity. And this is where we get to a really key concept, a concept known as de-individuation. This is when you become so immersed in the norms of the group that you lose your sense of self-identity and responsibility. For most people, our identity can involve things like our name and our clothing and our appearance and our history. But in this study, the guards and the prisoners had all of that removed so that their identity was the group, a prisoner or a guard. The mock prison itself was set up in the basement of the psychology department at Stanford University. There were three small cells with steel barred doors and across from the cells was a small closet that became known as solitary confinement or the hole. This room was completely dark and very, very small. The participants who were prisoners remained in the mock prison for 24 hours a day for the duration of the study. Whilst the guards worked on three man shifts for eight hours, and when they weren't in the mock prison, they could go home and carry on with their everyday life before they came back to do their next shift. And the behaviour of the prisoners and guards at all times whilst they were in the prison was observed, recorded and analysed. And the whole design of the study was to last two weeks. It got to the point where the behaviour of the guards became such a threat to the physical and psychological health of the prisoners that the whole study had to be shut down after six days. The guards strongly identified with their roles. They harassed the prisoners every day when they did head counts three times a day, sometimes in the middle of the night and the guards were quick to punish even the smallest offences. In response, the prisoners rebelled. They shouted and swore at the guards. So the guards dealt with the rebellion of the prisoners. The prisoners became passive and submissive to the brutal behaviours of the guards. They just accepted it. One prisoner, in one final act of rebellion, decided to go on a hunger strike. And for choosing to go on a hunger strike, one of the guards stuck him in the hole. Eventually, the guards' aggression was no longer simply a response to the threats that the prisoners posed, but actually became a normalized set of behaviors due to the uniform that they were wearing and the power that they had as part of their role. When the experiment was over and ended after the six days, the prisoners couldn't believe that they'd been let out so early, a sign of how much they'd conformed to the role that they were in. On the other hand, the guards were really disappointed that the study had come to an end because they'd become so used to their group identity and the power and control that they had in that role that they enjoyed it and no longer wanted it to end. So back to our question of the dispositional hypothesis or the situation. This study demonstrated the impact of the situation to influence the behaviour of the prisoners and the guards and showed the force of conformity to social roles 
to increase the aggressive behaviour in the guards and the submissive behaviour of the prisoners. And all of this in your normal, average, everyday Joe participant. From this study we can conclude that social roles affect behaviour and that behaviour is influenced by a loss of identity known as de-individuation where we take on and become so immersed in the group identity instead. Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment hasn't been without its critics, so let's discuss some of the strengths and limitations of this study. This study has been praised for its quality and controlled design. For example, the participants were carefully selected to take part in the study, they were emotionally stable and the least involved in antisocial behaviour to prevent these two factors from being extraneous variables. They also helped to reduce participant variables and researcher bias by carefully randomly allocating the participants to the roles of prisoner or guard. Therefore, for both of these reasons, it could be argued that Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment has good internal validity. The sample used in the Stanford Prison Experiment has been questioned in terms of its population validity. This is because the participants used were all American male college students who volunteered. And as such, this raises questions about how far the results can be generalised from this group of people to others. Methodological issue number three involves demand characteristics and investigator effects. The participants volunteered knowing that they were taking part in the study and were also getting paid $15 a day. So it's safe to assume that their behaviour might have changed in order to fit in with what was expected of them in the study. Now, in terms of investigator effects, we have the problem of Philip Zimbardo himself playing a dual role in the study. Not only of the researcher of the study, but also as the superintendent of the prison. At one point in the study, Zimbardo's own behaviour shaped and changed the events that took place. A particular prisoner came to talk to him about how he was struggling, and Zimbardo talked to him about potentially leaving, but asked him instead to be an informant on the goings-on of all the other prisoners. And this prisoner took it in his head that this meant actually there was no way that he could leave the prison. Therefore, as a result of Zimbardo's dual role and his direct involvement in the study, this could raise questions about the validity of the study. Methodological issue number four considers the lack of ecological validity. Legal and practical considerations in conducting a study like this makes the situation of having a prison very different from the actual conditions of a real life prison. For example, in this prison, the maximum sentence for them being there was only two weeks and that meant there were no consequences for misbehaviour which could extend their sentence. So, with the study taking part in the basement of a psychology department in a university, it could be argued that this study lacks ecological validity. However, to discuss this point somewhat, some have argued that the Zimbardo Stanford Prison Experiment actually had a high degree of ecological validity. The realistic nature of the prison was attested to by none other than a prison consultant for over 16 years, a public defender and a prison chaplain who all visited the simulated prison at one point during the study. Furthermore, the depressed effect that the study had on some of the prisoners, as well as the willingness on the part of some of the guards to work overtime for no extra pay, pointed to a level of reality in the prison that was as real as anybody who had ever experienced a prison. And then in terms of ethical issues, two issues have been raised. Firstly, some people have questioned the lack of informed consent in the study. And then secondly, the obvious lack of protection from harm for the participants. In conclusion, the Stanford Prison Experiment has led to a lot of discussion and opinion on human behaviour. Sadly, even to the point where one of the participants in the study who played the role of a guard received hate mail for his behaviour. Let's be slow to jump to the judgement about the character and nature, the dispositional view of human behaviour, and take a second look at the situational factors that can influence us all. In this study, guards, prisoners, and even researchers succumbed to the power to conform to social roles. What are the roles in your life where you feel the pressure to conform?